but uh, let me welcome my colleague bindu thirumalai who has been working with us at center for excellence in teacher education uh, as a faculty for past 6 years um, and we both have worked together on uh, many things including uh, our flagship uh, project on clicks and uh, development of modules design thinking workshops and uh, i feel very happy to uh, introduce her today to all the school synergy participants uh, for the topic of data handling and statistical thinking and i think that in today's time it is a very relevant topic especially when you know data is being uh, large data is being generated and uh, data is also presented every day in uh, social media in so many uh, different forms and one needs to have this kind of uh, you know um, data literacy sort of to uh, get a sense of what is being represented and how to make sense of it so uh, today uh, in a school synergy session uh, vidhu thirumalai will talk to us about it uh, you all know that uh, we have two parts uh, in a school synergy session uh the first part is in when the facilitator engages with the audience and discusses a topic and the second part is done after a week on the next saturday where we uh, expect the teachers and participants to come up with ideas uh that can be uh, that have generated from this uh, session itself and uh, how it is about how they have actually used these ideas in their own classroom with some students their own experiences or their own ideas of how this idea can be further developed into some sort of a lesson plan or an activity itself so we uh, hope that you will be attending both the sessions thank you for the introduction ruchi um and uh, thank you everyone for coming on a saturday afternoon to uh, to learn about data handling and statistical thinking um i hope you can see the screen uh and uh, i'll let you know when i change slides sometimes when i change it doesn't show up so uh just message uh, message on the chat uh somebody on the chat has said request to uh record i think it is being recorded uh if not sunil please record the session um so i would start by asking all of you uh, do any of you know when the topic of data handling came into the school curriculum all over the world uh, into a school curriculum into especially into elementary and uh, primary school curriculum do any of you know i'll keep the chat uh, i'll keep looking at the chat and yes after the 1986 np is right uh, you're right it it it's coming into even not only in india but even around the world uh, like especially new topics come in first into a context like uk and us even there uh, the topic of data handling is quite recent recent in the sense only in the 1970s and more uh ma mainstreamed in the 1980s uh did um um did uh, data handling enter the school curriculum now it so it's emerged in the 70s and 80s when i think uh, as ruchi mentioned that as we are seeing computers uh, come in as we being able to access more data will be able to collect more data uh that's when uh, data handling came into the school curriculum right from the primary grades uh, as early as even first and second grade uh, has has come into the school curriculum uh in the sense uh, the origins of statistics itself in the modern sense uh can be traced back to the 1600s where actually it's um, the modern statistics started off in um through this um, uh you know a national system of registration of births marriages and deaths in england and that is what prompted this whole uh, uh, this uh, the study of statistics or the domain of statistics 
as, as we see it in the modern age to emerge in, uh, uh, as a domain of knowledge. In fact, if you uh, look into higher education, um, they do not consider statistics as a domain uh, within mathematics. Uh, they, they talk about uh, mathematics being a separate domain and statistics being a, a distinct domain of its own. However, uh, in the school curriculum, uh, we have data handling, statistics, and probability that come into the school curriculum at various levels. Now, basically, what is data handling? Data handling is organizing, describing, representing, and analyzing data. That's what it is. And as you go into higher classes, you have, you know, uh, special techniques uh, uh, to do these uh, uh, techniques and tools to do do this uh, the work of data handling. And um, so, but in in the primary uh, stage, it's really about uh, these four things: organizing, describing, representing, and analyzing data. So, therefore, uh, if we look it from the origins of statistics, we find that uh, statistics actually originated in a very um, a social, uh, uh, the context is very social, and it is about the census, is it, it's about uh, finding out about mortality in a country, um, um, and, and now everything is data driven, right, because we all have Aadhaar cards now, and that is really what it is. It is data about uh, and uh, our identity. Um, and the, the, this kind of an identity has been there, um, you know, um, maybe a century ago, uh, more mainstream in the Western context. Now, pedagogically, that's why data analysis is really a um, topic for open-ended exploration because it's so connected to our uh, real li uh, everyday life that it's so connected to our uh, what is happening around us in our community therefore because we want uh, to encourage more open-ended exploration what we really must be doing with the data handling topics is more data and concepts I'll talk about these concepts soon less theory and formula even now if you go to secondary schools especially uh, you, you you're seeing that a lot of uh, um, formulas are being used a uh, lot of method focus on the methods of uh, you know uh, uh, computing mean median mode standard deviation but really it is about learning in the context of real data sets uh, students should be able to um, understand where this data is coming, coming from, possibly even create problems to collect uh, data and to find answers. So uh, pedagogically, we really need to about the data more and the concepts more than the theories and formula. Conceptually, data anas analysis, what is it doing conceptually in mathematics for us? It's really looking for patterns. It's trying to understand what is called reducing data. So you have a whole lot of data. How do you summarize or reduce this data? That is by understanding the center and the spread. When we say center, we talk about averages, mean, uh, averages or mean, median, mode. And when we talk about spread, we talk about how, uh, how spread out or clustered the data is where are the gaps what are the variations in this need to understand from data handling finally data and chance um, there is a lot of uh, research going on actually about uh, when to include probability within data handling of course you have them as topics in your high school as statistics and probability but more and more uh, they're wondering how to include the idea of chance within uh, in younger uh, grades also on younger standards of learning in fact some of the research uh, is showing that even children as young as six years old have a kind of intuitive understanding about chance 
uh, when uh, specific. I won't go into that detail because these are emerging uh, areas of uh, research and understanding with uh, data handling. Um, I'll just pause here in case anybody has any comments or questions. I have sent in the chat box. Yeah, it's there. In the... Can you read, Bindu? Yeah, what is the exact difference between content and data content pedagogically? And data content and data. Um, so content is like the, um, for example, the content in um, would be, um, you know, uh, knowing about charts, knowing about, uh, uh, knowing about different ways to display data, knowing, um, so uh, that is all the content. Um, all the tools, techniques, that is all content in uh, uh, data is actually uh, uh, data you're seeing from the field. Um, I will, uh, as I show you examples, I will tell you the difference between uh, content and data. Content in this context is uh, the, the textbook content. If you, if you open a statistics textbook, that is the content you will see. But the data is actually what you are collecting and analyzing. Uh, that would be the difference. But we, as we go with more examples, I'll show you. Yeah. So like I said, what, what does um, introductory statistics look like really when we talk about data handling? One is data description. So when we have data which we've collected, uh, and all data sets are collected for a particular reason to kind of understand a particular problem or to find a solution for a particular problem. And, uh, and, uh, and we then collect this data, we describe this data, we generate this data, we describe this data, and then we infer from this data and make like predictions, make uh, um, make uh, look at patterns to be able to make predictions or to be able to find solutions to certain problems. Now there are uh, and the main inferencing inference of from data is really analysis of data. Now uh, research uh, in one research uh, they, uh, they said that there are three main aspects of data analysis. Actually, this Hood Kershio came up with three. It says, when you have data in front of you, you need, to, you need to be analyzing data in three ways, looking at the data, which means you have a data in front of you, you need to be able to, uh, or students need to be able to describe that data in precise and quantitative terms. They should be able to describe the data. The next is looking between the data. So if, if you have, um, you would have seen in the newspaper a lot of data as we were in the lockdown, right? Every day you would probably see uh, data in the newspaper. What kind of data would you see when you were, uh, uh, you know, when we were going through this pandemic? Can you give an example of one type of data we saw? The number of people who are uh, being infected, uh, uh, number, number of COVID, of COVID cases. cases. Yes. So when we saw the number of COVID say, uh, uh, cases, how would they report it? Um, is it uh, all India or how would they report it typically? Statewide, yes. We reported statewide, district-wise, many uh, further right. categories. Many further, uh, exactly. So when you're looking at data, you're able to uh, look at the data and say, okay, there were 20,000 cases in uh, Maharashtra. There were 15,000 cases in Kerala. There were 10,000 cases in Karnataka, right? Looking between the data, between the data is means to be able to compare data. So you, you are then comparing and uh, looking between the data and saying, oh my God, I am seeing uh, many more cases in Maharashtra as compared to Goa, or uh, the cases in uh, Delhi are, you know, three times as much as the cases in Karnataka. Those are the kinds of, uh, uh, you know, those are the kinds of descriptions you will do 
when you are, or analysis you will do when you're looking between the data, when you're looking beyond the data. So what is an example of looking beyond the data in the case of COVID cases when you had this? What, what would perhaps with the number of cases, what, what are the kinds of uh, predictions they would be doing with, the, with this data? The population density and uh, cases come so with positive rate. Positive rate is one, uh, uh, but when you look, that is calculation with the data you have. But what does it mean to look beyond the data? Uh, the reason for a particular kind of a data can, uh, if I understand the question correctly. Um, You're right also, there, but that is looking behind the data. Yeah. And also extrapolating the data, how it uh, how it's going to unfold, uh, looking at the current scenario. Yeah, so what is an example Aruna of this inference? What is Bindu, that? Aruna Prabhu also says that, you know, it is about uh, uh, the peak itself, whether the peak is forming Correct, or whether yes. the peak is tapering off. Yeah. Yes, can we, can that we, is a good example of looking beyond the data. Can we so say another example? Peaks. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Can we give another example, ma'am? Please go ahead. Ma'am, uh, the uh, strike between Ukraine and Russia and the hiking prices of diesels and petrols in our country. Yes, yes. So when you're looking at that, you're predicting in the future that you're saying that because of the data we are seeing now, that we're saying in six months, this is the price of uh, the uh, uh, gasoline or petrol. Yes. Consequences of data observed in future with respect to the data at hand. Exactly. That is a very, um, but where, when we talk about uh, um, data and we have to uh, talk with examples and have to give uh, examples with data with students and looking behind the data, right? Uh, looking behind the data, somebody already said, where is this data coming from? Is it, what context is it coming from? What are the biases involved in this process? Is, see, data after all is being collected and by in some context by certain people. And um, we need to understand what is behind this data as well to be able to make authentic inferences as well. Right? So this is about just the introductory part of uh, statistics. Now, how, how has it come in the, uh, the curricular recommendations typically are organize and describe. Really, you collect, organize, and describe data. That's what they recommend in many of the national curriculums, including our NCF 2005. You construct, read, and interpret. You construct you read and you interpret displays of data, right? You explore, you explore uh, and infer uh, chance and random phenomena. So the one th more thing is very important is, like I said, what is data? Really you're collecting data because you want to, you have a problem and you want to look at the data uh, to try and find solutions for the problem or you want to uh, predict how better or worse that problem will become. So typically the COVID data has been used a lot for prediction because so many things were unknown about the problem of the pandemic, but really it's the problem of the pandemic that caused people to gather data around the uh, COVID. Then of course create, it's um, a lot of, uh, how data is communicated to people is through uh, visual representations. And visual representations are very, um, um, they can be very nice to communicate, but if used, uh, if not used appropriately, they can also be uh, uh, misunderstood very easily. So it, it's important to know how to create visual representations that are appealing that are easy to understand and they actually represent the data in a meaningful way. And of course, develop a critical attitude towards data. And why are we doing all this? What is our goal of data handling? Really, as the students grow, the ultimate goal is for students to be, um, not to learn up some formulas or uh, you know, use some tool in statistics. That is not the goal. The goal is to be able to make decisions based on data. 
however small or big the data is, are you able to make decisions based on data, predicting from data, and really further on hypothesis testing? If you're look, doing, looking at it in a more formal sense in your higher education and research, and with research. Right, so these are the curricular goals. Now I'm going to, I don't have time to go through displays. Um, so I'm going to very quickly go through um, a variety of displays we can use um, in the uh, uh, primary school itself. So you have Venn diagrams like this, when you can ask them to collect data. Remember I said, we, we have to learn how to make st students uh, uh, collect data. Why? Because they make sense of the data, then they know what that data is, right? Then uh, you have Carroll diagrams. These are actually, uh, um, you know, two variables and uh, and a, a four uh, cell tables where you say um, so. So if you see this uh, diagram here, it's it says um, it asks students how they come to school. Do they come by car? Do they come by bus? Do they walk? Or um, do they come by uh, bike, sorry, cycle, by car, bike, walk, or bus? <clears throat> now, the Carroll diagram, this is a Venn diagram, of course, and you can use the Venn diagram in many ways. Uh, and what is this universal set? This universal set would be the set of all students in the, uh, um, in the classroom, for example. Now, this is, is just two questions asked to the students. How the, was the data collected? Are you a girl? Yes or no. Do you come by car? Yes or no. So it's it's got four things. Either the, either the student is a girl and comes by car, or not a girl and comes by car, or a girl and does not come by car, or not a girl and does not come by car. So this, this is a simple way uh, to uh, represent this uh, in a picture form. Of course, in younger, in the early primary school, this is a pictogram. You can basically, instead of actually having symbol numbers, you can have pictures of how many students are coming by bus, by bike, by car, or by walk. Then we're talking about tally. Tallying, you know, you, you group it up in uh, groups of five. Then you have the frequency table. Then you have a block chart. And from a block chart, you evolve into a more, um, bar chart because a block chart doesn't have again uh, the symbols or the quantities explicitly written as symbols you can make out from the uh, picture itself and in a um, bar chart of course you you will need to read the uh, axis and the quantities through the axis then of course uh, when you come to charts you are then starting to look at of course, you have pie charts when you know have, when you have a small number of, for example, if you have a variable like gender, you know, know that there can be perhaps uh, three uh, or four uh, values, right? Male, female, other, transgender, other, or, uh, you know, you don't want to reveal your gender, maybe three or four or five, that, then you use a pie chart. And when you know the whole population, that's when you use a pie chart. A line chart is typically used, I haven't shown it here. A line chart is typically used when you're looking at data over time. Over, uh, so you'll see a line chart a lot in the newspaper when they're reporting data from you know, 2015 or a decade of data from 2010 to 2020 like that. When the, typically the x-axis is usually the, uh, the time timeline and the y-axis has the quantities or the values. So these are uh, a set of representations that can be used from the, uh, very early on, especially the Venn diagrams, the, the pictograms, the tally can be used from a very young age. So I'm going to uh, uh, pause here and what's the time? Yeah, I have time. So I'm going to pause here and uh, ask you all to keep a um, paper and pencil with you. And uh, so I am, so the idea is for students to, you should be able to convince students that we have a problem or we need to uh, 
they need to be interested in a problem. So this activity. So uh, what is the activity? The activity is uh, I have a, cl a class, my class, a third standard class uh, of total 25 students. Now, um, some guest has come and uh, given a bag of lollipops to um, for the students. Now the teacher, now my problem is, I want to know, are there enough lollipops to, um, to go around? 25 students and you know how third standard children are. They're very particular that uh, they want a particular color lollipop. Uh, they will always be picky. Someone will want a red color. Someone will want a blue color. So this is how you pose the problem to the uh, students. And now I'm going to ask them to actually collect data. See, in, in, uh, in all our data handling, we usually give them some table and ask them to analyze data or draw a chart or do something. But it's very important from a young age for children to go through the whole process, starting from understanding the problem or the context of the data. And in this case, it's not a very complex context in a third standard setting, right? It's a very simple context of a lollipop. And uh, unfortunately, what I have here is paper lollipops because it's a Zoom class. But I would probably bring, if I was allowed to give you real lollipops for the afternoon. So what am I going to tell these ch children? I'm going to tell them to, uh, I'm going to open out a, a one a lollipop at a time from the bag. And I'm going to ask you to, uh, keep a count of the different color lollipops that we have, right? So I will, in the class, obviously, we, if, you, if you have a paper and pen, you can... Okay, I'm going to stop now. I think you get the, right? So you actually display, pull out from the bag all these lollipops and I have a whole bunch of them here. And, and what, what are students going to be doing? First of all, I, I've asked them to do tally. So I should have told them how to do tally. Right, then I am going to have a set of questions that I'm going to use to explore. So I'm going to ask them how many green color lollipops are there? How many lollipops in total? What were, were there any color lollipops that were not there in the bag? Okay, can each student in class 3A get a lollipop? Which color lollipop will most students get. So when you're looking at this, what are the examples of looking beyond the data for a, a class three student from these questions? What is looking at data? How many lollipops are there? Yes, how many green lollipops are there? It's like looking at data, right? How many lollipops in total is one step removed? One, one more calculation there. Um, so were there any color lollipops that were not there in the bag? So can each student in class 3A get a lollipop? What kind of example is this? How are you looking at the data here? Remember this is for a 
six year old, seven year old, or eight year old student, right? Not for us. So, ma'am, quantitative data. And Chitra Rola is saying total number of students. Total number of students, because that is not directly visible. You'll have to uh, make some inferences to look at total number of students. You'll also have to make an inference to say that the total number of students is uh, 25. And did we count as many lollipops, right? Were there less than 25 lollipops, more than 25, or exactly 25 lollipops? So which color lollipop? will most students get? Now that is looking beyond the data because why you have to, now let me tell you the results, then you'll know. So, sorry. So, so first of all, you'll have to see if children know how to use this tally properly. What does that mean? Do children realize that uh, they must make one stroke on the correct row? So if they see a red lollipop, they have to make it on that red row of the tally chart for every lollipop they see, right? Then the second thing is, do children know how to make this fifth stroke? Then the third thing is, do are children counting by fives and tens actually when they come up with this total? Are they able to realize that this is five plus 10 plus two is 12, five plus two is seven? So you must have a variety of numbers then they must be able to tell you this is also actually um, a slightly higher order that they did not see any pink lollipops at all, but they saw a purple lollipop. But so they are understanding the use of tally here because you're trying to sort out the lollipops by color by pulling one at a time out and showing it to them, right? Then you are also asking them to look at a different kind of representation. This is like a block chart. Again, here we don't use numbers actually in this chart at all. We are using just the blocks. So here the red, 12 red blocks indicate 12 uh, red color lollipops. The seven blue indicate the seven blue lollipops and so on. And you see that pink is not there. Are students able to, uh, uh, describe that this graphical representation is the same as, as their tally, right? Those are things that uh, you can ask. And it is very important that we ask them. You can also ask them, which so, so they have to infer, right? Which color lollipop will most students get? So what is the answer to that? that oh, sorry. Red. So this is a uh, looking beyond the data because your your question is is not directly related to the uh, data. It's in that sense. So it, it's more complex as children grow older. The looking beyond data. But if you ask them to start doing things like this to infer beyond the data at a young age, then they learn how to do more complex things later. So these are the kinds of um, activities we must have with data handling. One is very important to set the whatever, uh, maybe your objective of your lesson was to really understand how to use the tally chart, chart and uh, sort out data with this tally mechanism, right? When do you use tally really? When you're observing something and you need to quickly record it uh, in your observation. So they need to understand that. They need to understand how to use tally properly. They need to be able to make certain inferences by looking at the data, by uh, looking between the data and looking, like you can say, how many more red lollipops are there than green lollipops? You know, you can even ask questions like, uh, do you think uh, what flavor, what fruit flavor is a red lollipop? What fruit flavor do you think a purple lollipop is? That is also looking beyond uh, uh, the data. 
right? It's, and it's, it's, it's not even related to quantities. Then it's related to the context of lollipop. We are saying most lollipops are made of fruits uh, or fruit flavored. And that's why they have these different colors, right? And then you can even introduce that idea or make that connection with students. So it's very important. One is that you create a problem. Now, the problem we created here was, do, does every uh, student in class 3A get a lollipop? And we are, they are keen to know if the, which color lollipop they will be able to get, right? And they should be able to realize in the end that most of them will probably get the red color lollipop, right? And then maybe uh, they can also, the teacher can also ask them, how do you want me to distribute the lollipop? Since it's not even, it's not like every uh, flavor has five lollipops that I can give to, uh, you know, five distribute evenly among the colors. Some people are going to get green, some purple, but most of them will get red. So they can even have a discussion around uh, the social idea of distributing lollipops in the class. So these are all looking uh, outside the quantities itself, right? So you need to have a problem which is real and contextual for the student. You need to enable them to collect the data. Uh, when they collect the data, they have more ownership of the data. Then organize the data, display the data, and then do analysis of the data. So any tasks you do, you must work around all these elements in when you're talking about data handling. So I'm going to uh, go with some, uh, explain to you a framework, a statistical thinking framework. So now, uh, this research that has been done into statistical thinking. And this research is uh, done by uh, researchers, a um, um, number of researchers, and uh, they've written a paper around developing children's statistical thinking and developed a framework based on research. Now, what does this framework consist of? So they're saying really when we are doing data handling from primary school itself, we um, just so when we are doing um, um, you know uh, talking about conceptual understanding of and developing statistical thinking, really there are they they they, they say there are four key statistical processes, which is describing data, organizing and reducing data, uh, representing data and analyzing and interpreting data. Now, what, is, what could describing data be? I think it's fairly straightforward. Can any of you uh, attempt what describing data is? It's about the... Uh meaning of every data unit or the attributes around the data. Correct. Looking so what at, we say is that looking at looking, data. Looking right? at data, yes. Yes. So it really means it involves extract, uh, extracting information from data and basically uh, look, making connections between the data and the context from which this uh, data came. So that's why data is not just some number hanging there or some variable hanging there. It, it is very much connected to a context. So uh, describing data is basically the ability to extract information from this data and making connections with the context it came from. What would organizing and reducing data be? Looking between the data. Um, well, sort of, but it does, it's not a direct uh, parallel to that. It is really about, uh, includes ordering the data, grouping the data, um, and uh, reducing the data means what? Summarizing the data. So being able to say that from this data, you can say what is the average uh, uh, or what is the maximum or what is... Um, you know, summarizing the data and being able to, in terms of spread and center, spread and 
center are the two most important ways uh, data is summarized. Two of the main ways that data is summarized. So really when you're uh, organizing and reducing the data, you are organizing in terms of sorting it uh, by something, um, you know, from a minimum to a maximum, you're sorting it or you're sorting it by certain categories, like we sorted it by colors. You're um, reducing the data means you, you're saying, what is the average? If it makes sense, what is the average? What is the highest? What is um, summarizing the data, basically? What is representing the data that is easy, right? is the ability to construct various uh, visual representations of the data. So um, that is the um, um, representing the data. And the final one, of course, is analyzing and interpreting data. So when we say analyzing and interpreting the data, we are really saying that is when you come at looking at the data, looking between the data, looking beyond the data. And of course, now we say it's also important to look behind the data, right? So the, the fourth process is really the uh, part of looking at between. Uh, <coughs> so when you ask, when you make these lesson plans and activities and tasks, really you must be able to do all these. You must give opportunity to students to be able to do tasks around describing, organizing and reducing, representing and analyzing and interpreting data. And what the researchers also say is that it's like a grid, it's like a table, that for every process, like for describing data, for organizing and reducing data, children go through four levels of thinking. And these four levels they call idiosyncratic, uh, uh, it's called, uh, I think, uh, transitional, then uh, quantitative, and then analytical. So in, in the level one, which is idiosyncratic, basically, if you ask, give some chart or something to uh, students or look, give some data or a table or a chart to students, they will not make any connections. What they tell you is will be completely unrelated to the data. Then you know that the student is at, at the very beginning. Uh, um, of um, uh, statistical thinking. The second is they're able to make some sense, partial sense of either the chart or a table or the data you give them in whatever form you've uh, displayed it. They call it a data display. So, so they will begin to make some reasoning. It may not be complete. It may not be a complete understanding, but there'll be a partial. Now, level three is when they can do quantitative reasoning is used. So in that activity I gave you, all children may not be at a level where they can answer all these questions. They may not be at a level where they've understood how to tally. They may not be able to count the tally and say, this is the total. So they might be at that level. They might see the tally table and not make sense of it at all. Uh, then they're at the level one. If they make some sense of it, they're at level two. If they're able to reason with quantity, able to tell you that there are 12 red lollipops or seven blue lollipops, or that there are uh, you know, five green, so there are two less lollipops in green than blue, reasoning like that, then they know they're looking at the data and they, they're able to make sense of the quantities involved. Then level four is when they actually look beyond and behind the data and they make connection very important when they're making inferences, they're able to make connections between the data and the context again, right? And to reach this analytical stage between the data and the context, that is why it's very important to be able to set a problem, set a context, collect data to be able to come up to level four. So what are the types of questions you will ask um, in your, and I'm going to give you an example. I'm not running out of time, right? Yeah, I am actually. So I will very quickly go through this. Uh, when you're describing, uh, when you're asking students to describe data, what are the kinds of questions you will ask? 
what does this picture tell you? You may have like a pictogram or a simple um, chart, you know, which is not a very complex or even a, a, a block chart like that. You can just ask to, uh, students, what does this picture tell you? Are they able to make sense of it at all? Then what do you think these pictures uh, re represent? One very nice way of seeing if they understand the data and representation is really give them two charts which represent the same data or two displays which represent the same data and ask them, uh, see if students understand that they actually represent the same data, right? That is one way. And you can actually ask them which one of these pictures would be more useful for you. Uh, children are able to discern which picture is better, better readable or not. Right? Then organizing and reducing. How would you organize this data in another way? You know, you can ask them how they organize this data in another way. Can you tell in the graph which with a different organization of the data, how many? So again, this is organizing is when it's organized differently, how many red color lollipops are there? How many uh, yellow color lollipops are there? And importantly, in reducing, reducing is same as summary. What is the average number of, uh, the, the, I'll show you the example they've given and uh, that, that is from the example. What is the average number of uh, friends who came to visit? I'll show you that task. But basically finding out the average and what is the greatest spread, which scores, this is again from the example, but again, you're asking the spread, you know, uh, what you can ask like maximum and minimum. What are the minimum uh, number is yellow has only one maximum is 12. So you can uh, ask things like that. The spread may not be so useful in this particular task, but you can appropriately make tasks which need uh, uh, need an answer for spread. Representing is you can give them a partial graph actually. We gave them the whole block chart. You can give them uh, a partial chart, just maybe do the red and the yellow and then ask them to fill in the rest of the lollipop in the block chart. And again, again ask them if they can draw another chart uh, to represent the same data. Analyzing and interpreting is again, you looking, you comparing the data, you're combining the data, you're making predictions, you're extrapolating from uh, what the picture doesn't tell you, but what you can predict and infer from, from this uh, data. So these are the kinds of questions. And you can, you can start asking these kinds of questions from a very young age, only they will be simple, uh, analysis and I mean to you they look simple but to children it is not so simple at that age it is it is a very higher order uh, task when it comes to analyzing and interpreting now um, very quickly I will show you this example this is how the researchers asked so they set up this um, on the right side if you see they set up um, this 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 task this task here it says Sam has some friends come to visit each day during one week in the summer. The number of friends and the days they visited were displayed like this, right? So this is one display. Friends came to visit and there is a cross for the number of friends. Now, if you see this D1, a, D1 is a display uh, uh, description, the first uh, key process, right? Uh, a is analysis, O is organization and reducing, R is representing. So what is the kind? So they're simply showing this and saying, what does this picture tell you? So this is the, this is the context of the data. This is one kind of display that is there. And this is another kind of display that is there. So if you see the questions they're asking, what can't you tell from this picture? Can any of you think of what can't you tell from this picture? Whether the friends were girls or boys, <clears throat> which day they visited? Correct. A day they visited, yes, is there. Date, we don't have. But uh, that's an excellent answer is which, whether the, uh, the friends were girls or boys. So you see, sometimes kids will answer like this. They'll say seven boys came on Saturday because Sam is a boy. 
I mean, they think Sam is a boy. That is when you ask the question, do you know that it's seven boys who came to visit? Does the data tell you that, right? So, so they should also be able to say what can't they say from this data. Similarly, a question like this about how many friends would you expect to come to Sam's place every week during the summer vacation? How many friends would you expect to visit Sam during four week month? Right, so this is more taking the data and uh, looking beyond and uh, extrapolating information from the data. Then they're showing this visit in another uh, bar chart like this. And then they're asking you if you can, what does this picture tell you? So they're asking the students, were the students able to say that this chart is telling the same information as this chart? How are the two pictures alike? Do you think the pictures represent the same data? Which one of these pictures would be more useful? Which one do they like more? And why do they like it more as a student? Can you draw it? Then you will, uh, you can see displays are all about best fit. You can actually display any kind of data and any chart, but will it be meaningful is the, uh, is the question here. Is it a best fit for this kind of data? And that's what, that, that is the kind of uh, uh, reasoning that you statistical thinking that you develop among uh, students. So they have um, about two examples in the primary school. Someone else has used this framework and actually worked out tasks and examples for middle school also. So, but the, the key to it is really, like I said, I keep reminding you, it's the context, it's being able to collect data uh, and then organize, reduce or summarize and make inferences with the data. These, are, from the very primary age, if you, if you start developing uh, statistical thinking, by the time they get to the formal statistical part, it becomes very easy to, to understand these statistical techniques and uh, make sense of it and not as just formula and uh, methods to follow, but actually making sense of the data. So the findings from this research, so they, this uh, framework was based on, uh, sorry, this framework was based on a, a one year research that they did with uh, different students of different age groups. And what they found was that the stability of thinking across all four constructs, she calls them, or the key processes was, uh, was stable. That means if, uh, if a student was in the level one thinking and describing the data, more often than not, 80% of these students were also in level one thinking with analysis and uh, this thing. It's uh, maybe uh, in about 10 to 20%, uh, uh, there was a difference. Otherwise, it was stable. All four constructs, that is um, um, describing, um, um, organizing, uh, representing, and analysis, they were, it was stable. They were all either at level one, level two, level three, or level four. Rarely was there a difference in the levels per student. The second was obviously, it's, it's obvious, but they have found that analyzing and interpreting the data may be most challenging for students. So some of them may be in level three thinking for uh, in, in, in different constructs, but they were levels lower in the analysis uh, uh, construct. So that is the most complex. and. The flip side is it, some students find it easier to describe data. So the uh, uh, describe, describe data was at the highest level. And also what they found out was that really for describing the data, there is no uh, level four or analysis. It, stopped at, it stops at level three. Once they've reached level three, uh, then they can describe data well. There's really no, no idea of analysis with description or data. 
So this just came uh, in the, the Hindu. There's a data point that comes um, you know, every week in the Hindu. And it's a, it's a very, very interesting uh, uh, thing to read. I, I always read it because in, in, in one uh, five minute summary with three, four charts, you kind of know. And this is really what uh, newspapers do. They are really looking behind and beyond the data. They're not interested in just describing data to you, newspapers, right? They are critically looking at data. And which is why we need a kind of critical understanding of data. Any newspaper you take will have a chart for a reason because they will look behind and give you the context and what is happening here. They're talking about the heat wave. They are, see, they're doing a line graph with timelines here. I, I, it doesn't show very clearly, but this is timelines. In the last six months, they're displaying the trends of the wheat that is there, the, the temperatures that are there. This is a different chart with a map. And then uh, with just four charts, they are able to uh, display the data and give you a, a um, summary. In, in one summary, what are they saying? That the heat wave may curtail wheat export, which means what? You can infer that wheat export is going to, that uh, wheat production is going to be reduced because of the heat wave. Yeah, these are the references and uh, that's what I hope I've kept time, Ruchi. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, so I'll just pause here and uh, any discussions yeah. or questions we can. Yeah. I think uh, you have been on excellent time. Uh, I would just ask the participants if they have any further questions um, to Bindu about this. And I would also like, uh, you know, uh, to share uh, certain ideas about how, uh, what kind of exercises, what kind of activities, uh, you know, you can uh, use from this presentation, from this discussion into your own classrooms. What kind of work would you like to do in your own classrooms? You can even speak about that. So we'll start it today and we will continue the discussion uh, next week again uh, when we discuss about the implementation and experience uh, sharing part. So just like a few of you at least to speak up. Thanks, Chitra. Would, we would really like to hear from you also how you will be able to use the ideas from this session in your classroom. Yeah, thank you for uh, this session. Uh, it was really full of information and uh, we do uh, follow all this. We do teach our uh, this uh, data handling is one of the topic in our math subject uh, and we follow all these steps. Uh, like data collection, data interpretation, and uh, presentation, all these follow. And the activities which uh, ma'am has showed, uh, that lollipop activity, I really like that. I'm going to implement that thing in my class with my small children because I teach in a primary section. And uh, one more thing, like what ma'am said, many, what I have observed in my class, like children get confused when we are, they are able to collect the data, but when we ask them how many more we require or how many less are there at it. so they get confused at this point so we have uh, so that is the area we have to work on that and uh, yes all this present all this many of the like types of uh, information presentation like different types of graphs and all it will be useful for higher primary like four five six grades definitely and i'm going to share this with my colleagues so thank you so much ma'am thank you chitra so these representations are uh, something you can use like you know these charts and pictograms is something you can make children get used to even in primary age uh, you know they, they can be picture charts also. You don't have to uh, make them formal bar charts. And, uh, you know, you can start with very simple charts, learn how to make visuals which are very simple, and then move to more sophisticated uh, uh,
this place. Yeah. Right, ma'am. Uh, Chandan, I think you have raised your hand. Yeah, yeah, Chandan. Please go. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, can we relate the poor thinking levels of the data analysis with uh, uh, action verbs of uh, Bloom's taxonomy? Um, you, I, I think that the, so. You see, the Bloom's taxonomy is really uh, the objectives you want. Of course, there is um, uh, higher order thinking, uh, but there is no direct uh, mapping like that. These are cognitive, um, um, you know, thinking processes, and they're very specific to uh, uh, the thinking processes for statistical thinking. So um, I, I, I do not find it useful to uh, map them. Bloom's taxonomy is used for a different purpose. And uh, the statistical thinking is to more see what is going on in students' mind, right? Uh, with, uh, with how they are thinking through the, how they're reasoning, statistically reasoning in, uh, in the class. Uh, Bindu, if I may uh, offer some suggestion here. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, in statistical uh, uh, thinking also, as uh, Bindu was saying, you know, there can be questions of different level itself, like the, the uh, first level where it is just uh, recognizing or recall about a certain kind of data. Whereas there can be questions which are about evaluating or comparing data, as she was talking about looking in between the data or, you know, looking beyond the data. So those kind of questions would be at a slightly hi higher level in terms of Bloom's taxonomy. And if we ask the students to collect the data themselves and then to create different visual representations, that would be at the highest level of create itself. So yes, uh, in some ways, perhaps you can uh, connect, but you know, it is about uh, different people seeing it a different way and uh, there can be different interpretations about it. So, yeah. Bindu, I... Uh, yeah, that's, what that's I perfect, yeah. yeah. So of course you can think because these are also uh, ways of developing uh, students' uh, uh, cognitive uh, development, right? So they are all interrelated. It's how you use them actually. And uh, the mapping that um, uh, Ruchi gave as an example is good, uh, is a good mapping between Bloom's taxonomy and statistical thinking. So I'm so happy that you are all, uh, you know, starting to think about uh, using this. And uh, I think when we start, uh, there might be initial, you know, you find it difficult to think and, you know, how you are going to use it in the classrooms, or you may use the things which are directly there in the session, like the lollipop activity. But we would really want you to, you know, think about the ideas, especially the framework Bindu, that you had presented about looking at the data, looking between the data, looking beyond the data. I really uh, would uh, uh, re recommend and encourage all you, all of you to think, to use that framework, to come up with some activity of your own about the data. Maybe it can be data that they are, uh, you know, uh, it can be about their daily activities itself, which they are very much familiar with. And uh, maybe it is uh, the, it is a data which can uh, give us uh, certain ideas about uh, maybe uh, the role of gender or social justice also. So mathematics and different uh, social aspects can even be combined together in uh, data analysis. So uh, please do think about it. And I'm hoping that you come up with very interesting ideas next week again, same time, 3 p.m. And uh, uh, we are really, so we will become the listeners and we will listen to your ideas and we will generate a discussion on that. So hoping to have that. Yeah, Bindu, go ahead. I'm sure we'll have many more ideas and uh, activities. So, um, yeah. you know, this, the, the idea of this lollipop activities was only to show you from beginning to end how you can, you know, even in a simple yeah. way, uh, because generally teachers feel very overwhelmed with data collection, especially for small children, right? You feel that data collection means going out somewhere, you know, talking to people, doing something, but it, it can be something so simple as sorting something in, available in the classroom. And, but, but students connect with it and see it as data. Yeah. 
Okay. So uh, I hope you would have filled the um, feedback form. I had uh, shared the link here. And if you want, you can continue the discussion on the School Synergy Teachers Forum. Uh, you can post questions, ideas, and discuss it uh, before we have the session next week in case you want to have get more ideas from everyone. Okay. So see you all next week. Uh, that's all from for today. And thanks a lot, Bindu, for such an engaging session. Thank you. It's a pleasure.